the creature with the red eye gazed ahead. Its paw with scarlet claws dug into the ground. The enormous beast opened its mouth and roared at the three soldiers who were close by. They stared back at the creature with resolve. It launched an attack at them, and the monster expressed its astonishment at these mere mortals daring to challenge it. The ground erupted beneath the feet of the three individuals. The man in the azure suit landed on the ground, causing the asphalt to split beneath his foot. He leaped up with remarkable strength and swung his sword, cleaving the monster in two. The man wore a satisfied smile as an explosion erupted behind him, reducing the monster to fragments. He approached the sinkhole, his sword breaking into pieces. Retrieving a fragment of the dragon's blood scroll, he held it with a grin. A message appeared before him, inquiring whether he wished to combine all nine fragments of the scroll. The fragments circled around him and merged into a five-star legendary dragon blood scroll. He held the scroll with delight. Suddenly, a person stabbed him in the back, causing the scroll to fall from his grasp. It was his sister, who apologized to him and vowed to safeguard the scroll and Jojo for him. Her name was Mukin. The player G was struck by the critical strike skill of the player Muin, losing 32 million HP. Jangi lay in the sinkhole, bloodied, as the system informed him that he had no remaining resurrection options. Thus, he met his demise. Apocalypse a virtual reality game created by thousands of top designers worldwide had cost 3 trillion yuan and taken five years to develop. It was a modern action game narrating the story of the mid-21st century when alien monsters invaded Earth through wormholes, attacking humans. The ensuing conflict caused severe ecological damage to the planet and all non-human beings underwent mutations. To escape this catastrophe, players had to enter the game, as those who refrained from doing so would be violently killed by the apocalypse system and turned into NPCs in the game world. After the open beta version of the game was launched, the players who entered found themselves unable to leave, forced to remain in the game indefinitely, instilling fear and panic among them. One player who had been in the game for eight years awoke after being betrayed by his best friend and lover. He could not accept this and shouted out in confusion. The clock indicated that it was August 28, 2025, with the Apocalypse World's Gate set to open in two hours and twelve minutes. The voice from the clock asked if the players were prepared. Johnny held the clock in his hands, shocked because the Apocalypse had not even been announced at that time. He peered out the window, where everything appeared peaceful. Jangi realized that he had returned to a time before the game's launch. His foremost goal was to locate the scattered divine talent cards before the game officially started. He searched for information about these cards on the internet. In the game, the system would randomly bestow talents upon all players. When they join the game, rare divine talents can only be activated by finding a talent card. In reality, Sky Fortune, the creator of Apocalypse, introduced 10 divine talent cards that were scattered randomly worldwide. If the card's location remained unchanged, the closest divine card to him was atop the Gone Ma building, the tallest shopping mall in Linai City. Johnny rushed to the city running through the streets and scaling the building. Sure was correct. The card was indeed there, hovering on a pedestal. It's Hugh Golden. A man who identified himself as J.I. Lewin claimed ownership of the entire Gal building, including the map. Jangi argued that the one who arrived first possessed the map. This guy had been the owner of the last divine talent card in his previous life. And Linga, the heir to the largest real estate company in Lei had several armed men take aim at Jangi, who had begun shooting. Linga threatened him for taking what didn't belong to him. As the clouds parted, bullets whizzed past, saying, 
he reversed his course, running to the wall, leaping down, and checking his watch. It was five seconds past twelve. Jan sprang for the map. Luwing shouted at him, warning not to entertain thoughts of taking his card. Jean seized the map, and in his eyes, he saw L's reflection. He fired at him, and the bullet streaked towards his head. There was a loud noise in his ears. It was twelve o'clock, and the bullet was in front of Jang's eye. A silhouette appeared over the city, a man clad in a dress adorned with gold jewelry. The game had begun. John held a map in his hands and a choice before his eyes. Did he want to enter the apocalypse? John rapidly made his decision, and he was engulfed by a vortex, his player data dissolving and downloading. People were bewildered, disintegrating, and vanishing from the streets. A figure loomed over the city, instructing everyone to go to the world intended for players. A peculiar eye materialized. Jean returned to the apocalypse, standing in front of the pyramid with the eye, and the card spun within a magical field. It was a map of divine talent. Jean approached it, reaching out for the card, and a feather descended. A stunning flying creature with long blonde hair appeared. Jean finally received the card, bearing his name, his age of 22, and the fact that he was unemployed. The creature addressed John as player number 8857, his unique gaming spirit, congratulating him on acquiring a rare divine talent card for personal use. Its ability was to replicate the talents of other players with a one-hour recharge time. They stood in a circle with three colored lights, where there were three camps to choose from in the game, elves, animals, and humans. They could select their preferred camp. Jean contemplated, recalling that in his previous life, he had chosen the human camp, where players could boost their prestige rating by 20%. In the apocalypse, prestige was paramount. The spirit communicated something to Jang and held a bundle, a scroll of Duan blood. Jang couldn't fathom how it ended up there, jesting that the item much and desired would still be his. The system detected the dragon blood scroll, and the hidden dragon camp was now accessible. This piqued Jang's curiosity. He stood in front of the gate and approached it. Jong touched the entrance with his hand, and a bright light illuminated. He made his way to the public transportation area. Others gathered around Jang. He walked past them, and it was the same start as before. The people around him were enthusiastic about the game's design, eagerly anticipating the opportunity to defeat monsters. There was a haze in the corridor, and Johan checked his status. He possessed a unique ability of the dragon race. Every time he executed a regular attack or used a skill, there was a one-tenth chance of summoning a hell dragon, causing all enemies within range to receive 150% of the attack power as damage. Although the chance was relatively low, the effect was nearly as beneficial as a divine talent card. Now, Jean wanted to become familiar with the card. He wished to replicate someone's skill. The sun shone brilliantly, with fragments scattered all around. A passenger on the bus had mentioned that having him on the team would provide relaxation. Jang's hand extended toward that man, selecting him as his target, and he grabbed the man by the shoulder. The bald individual turned to him and inquired, pretending not to understand if Jean was seeking a fight. He withdrew his hand, scratched the back of his head innocently, and apologized, admitting his confusion. John succeeded in copying the epic talent of the treasure hunter, which allowed him to locate the nearest treasure chests within a radius of 500 meters. The epic level feature delighted Jean. A voice came from the speakers, welcoming everyone to the apocalypse. It was a bespectacled man in a room with a microphone. He encouraged everyone to enjoy the game wholeheartedly and, in a somewhat suspicious tone, 
referred to everyone as his warriors. The bald man walked confidently toward the train window. Jang's hand swiftly blocked his path. He stood before the man, cautioning him not to act recklessly because it was highly perilous outside. The bald man pushed Jang and labeled him a coward, asserting that it was merely a game. He then climbed through the broken window, urging others to continue hiding and watch him. A short while later, he leaped out of the window, only to find himself in the clutches of a mutated spider. Player 13,580 fell victim to a massive spider with no means of revival. The bald man lay in front of the computer, wearing headphones. The monitor displayed that the game was over. Zhang sat before the monitor with an apprehensive boy beside him. The player had perished. Zhang exclaimed that it was no longer just a game. If they died in the game, they would die in reality. It was a struggle for life. A swarm of spiders was closing in on the train, and their task was survival. They had to locate a safe zone and follow the map to reach the 886 safe zone in the Eth district, known as the City of Hope, where safety was guaranteed. They had three hours and 58 minutes to achieve this, and the reward was the chance of resurrection. In the event of failure, death awaited them. Panic spread among the people around them. The girl was uncertain about what to do because they were surrounded by monsters. The man informed her that the only option left was to regain their composure and confront the monsters head on. John discovered an object in the luggage. In the compartment, there was an emergency hammer that had served as a weapon for someone in car seven during Jang's past life. It turned out to be a high-quality blue-disguised weapon, which made other players quite envious. The hammer transformed into a sword, just as Jang anticipated. It became a blue-quality ice blade crafted from cold and meteorite iron. What's more, Zhang had activated his newly acquired talent, which could detect the presence of a treasure box hidden in the wagon. His vision became X-ray, revealing the standout box. Jang reached under the seat and discovered the box, which contained a blue-quality dragon's breath potion. Someone flew out of the carriage and dispatched the spiders. It was Jang, slashing them with his weapon. The presence of his formidable weapon left everyone astounded. Even in the face of numerous monsters, caution was essential. The spiders remained vigilant prompting Zhang to distance himself from them. He climbed up the slope, taking out a potion and opening it. Zhang threw the dragon flame at the spiders, causing them to shatter, and the monsters to ignite in bright flames. This action increased Zhang's level, granted him 50 copper coins, and awarded him a life potion. Zhang was delighted and eager to find more dragon potions. The people in the wagon were taken aback by his swift victory. Some doubted him, thinking that Jean was using cheats. Nevertheless, a few wanted to form a team with him because they believed he wasn't a novice. Jean was ready to follow the map to the City of Hope, even though it was already dark. He walked while examining the map. He heard someone running, and the man approached Jang, falling to his knees, begging for help in rescuing his daughter, who had been captured by monsters. In Jang's past life, many players had encountered trouble in the forest, but it was rumored to contain valuable items. The man's expression appeared almost demonic. Jang turned to leave and continued walking, sensing something strange in the forest. He noticed a little girl standing with candy, crying, Zhang approached her and offered assistance, recognizing the danger of the location. A man and a woman appeared in the distance, thanking Zhang. He was uncertain about the situation. The woman mentioned that Zhang had brought them another prey. Zhang's task now was to rescue the girl from the forest and return her to the City of Hope. He had 59 minutes to complete the mission, with Talia's ring as the reward, and in case of failure, nothing. Jang remembered from his past life 
that many people had encountered this hidden quest while exploring the dark forest and were eager to accept it for the rewards and experience. He didn't want to miss this opportunity, so he accepted the task. The woman's hands transformed into paws with claws, and she instructed the girl to stay still as she intended to make her dinner. Jang tearfully advised the girl not to run and wait for him to resolve the situation and take her to the village. A sword materialized in his hand as he attacked the woman, whose skin seemed to be made of steel. The spirit informed Jang that he was facing a magical spider, a 20th rank boss, and it would be wiser to abandon the task due to insufficient skills. As he charged toward the giant spider, he recollected a video mentioning the presence of a hidden box nearby, potentially containing a skill book that could aid his victory. John activated the treasure hunter skill, spotting the box. He evaded the spider, slipping between her legs. The spider realized she wasn't the target of his attack. Jang reached the box, opened it, and the giant spiders retaliated. Jang acquired a blue item, the same skill book. Row of lightning! The spiders closed in on Jean as he extracted the book, which had the ability to unleash a sequence of lightning bolts that bounced from one enemy to another, inflicting 200 points of damage with each attack. At this point, the spider was preparing to attack Jean. But he touched the book and immediately received an item. Lightning shot from his hands, targeting the spider. Zhang employed his skill and vanquished all the enemies, celebrating the reward. An epic weapon named the Poison Dagger, infused with spider venom, capable of dealing 20 points of damage to an enemy. Zhang took the girl's hand and escorted her home, earning her gratitude. The beautiful city of hope loomed on the horizon as they traversed the bridge, passing by people. A man behind them asked his boss if he was the one who had stolen his divine talent card. Among the many composed individuals in the city of hope were Zong and a girl. The girl thanked her brother for bringing her home. Jang received Talia's ring, which boosted his luck by 55 points. In the apocalypse, luck was a rare attribute, influencing task rewards. Shong turned towards the noise emanating from the man at the anvil, who was proclaiming his ability to enhance items for a fee. Many gathered around him, and Zhang suspected foul play, perplexed by the high success rate of improvement. It was explained that the man possessed a talent for forging and refining, managing to forge a potent weapon. Jean grew intrigued and touched the blacksmith's hand, thereby copying the epic talent. Now, his chances of successfully upgrading equipment increased by 50%. Jean stood beside the forge, holding the poison dagger, which he elevated to the 15th level. The spectators were astounded, but Jang was delighted since he no longer needed to worry about future equipment upgrades and had a promising business opportunity. All eyes were on the level 15 epic weapon, sparking discussions and speculations about Jean's origins. Jane began to perspire and breathe heavily as his stamina had significantly depleted. He required rest, and the nearest tavern was the ideal place for it. The tavern served as a special resting place for players post-battle. Jane settled at the bar and procured a single room, receiving a key. He overheard discussions about a fortunate player on the World Channel who had completed a secret mission in the Dark Forest and obtained an epic weapon. Jayan believed that luck was also a part of the Sida, but he would strive to balance these two attributes. Jean rested in a tavern room, pondering how he could expedite reaching level 20 and alter his profession. After a player achieved level 20, they could change their profession to one of seven classes. The choices included knight, berserker, assassin, mage, archer, priest, and beast lord. John eagerly anticipated the chance to get even with Machin for his betrayal. As the sun rose, the boy ventured through the forest. Glancing to the side, 
he requested whoever was hiding to reveal themselves. It turned out to be Lukia, who emerged and informed Jang that he had been fortunate the last time, but it wasn't certain he could replicate that success. A whole camp of people gathered behind Jang, exchanging glances, while the computer enforced force mode, causing all the players to turn red. Jean confidently attempted to employ a series of lightning bolts against those tormentors, but to no avail. An indicator materialized above Jane, who couldn't fathom the situation, thinking he was silenced, rendering him unable to use his skills. Linnea disclosed that Jane wouldn't be able to utilize his skills for two minutes and urged him to accept his fate. Jane endured the first punch to his face, seemingly unaffected which bewildered his assailants. His sturdy equipment rendered their strength insufficient. The individual whose card had been pilfered berated his underlings as losers and intervened personally. Jang recognized that the man's weapon was of blue rare quality, upgraded to the 15th level. Luing shot an arrow at Jang, unleashing a meteor shower of arrows. Despite their numbers exceeding a hundred, Jang remained unscathed. He decided to take action, summoning the Hell Dragon. A colossal dragon materialized above the adversaries who opted to flee. Jang pointed his hand at them, summoning the flames of the Hell Dragon, breathing fire at the fleeing enemies, halting their escape. Everything came to a standstill as the players vanished, including the dragon. On the ground lay a bow that Zong had retrieved, reaching the 20th level and obtaining equipment. Thanks to that individual, Jang now possessed a level 15 silver moonbow, with arrows that fragmented into hundreds of particles, falling from the sky like meteors. The system congratulated Sean on reaching the 20th level, urging him to visit the main city and locate a career change officer to commence the test. The individuals who had attacked Jean were resurrected at the Fountain of Rebirth, as is the case for players. People who had the opportunity for a fresh start gathered there. Sean approached them and expressed his gratitude for their weapons. Much unseated with anger and issued threats toward Jang, who was already walking away. Jang wished him good luck and continued strolling through the city, bathed in the fading sunlight. Gene reached a career change officer and declared his intention to change his profession. The officer extended his hand and opened the dungeon. Jang entered the red teleporter and found himself within a vast palace. The role of the animal patron profession was not highly sought after. Jang stood beside a robed man with a bird perched on his shoulder. Jean contemplated that even though patrons could delegate menial tasks to animals, the difficulty of raising them remained. Jang was reluctant to select this profession because when raising animals, all resources received were shared between the human and the animal. Resources in the apocalypse were scarce, so the patron profession might not prosper in the future, rendering it the weakest choice. For individuals of the dragon race, the suitable professions were knights and animal patrons. Knights seemed promising initially, but they grew weaker in later stages of the game, which led to player deaths in Jang's past experiences. However, the beast patron was distinctive, benefiting from a divine talent that granted them ten times more resources than others. Utilizing the dragon race, they could acquire formidable companions and form an ideal team. Jang ultimately opted for the profession of an animal patron. The robed man touched Jang's forehead with his finger, signifying his profession selection. Jang's body started to absorb new energy. Meanwhile, people gathered in the Hope Square. A stranger congratulated Jean on his successful choice. Two individuals passed by him and shared their unfortunate experiences in the city of dead spirits. Jang overheard their conversation and recollected that, with his past life experience and a well-assembled team, defeating the boss in the first dungeon wouldn't pose a problem. Nearby voices called for players 
to join their expedition to the City of Dead Spirits. Players who had reached level 20 and altered their professions had two available spots. A girl in a robe approached them, expressing her desire to join their team, and they welcomed her. Jean approached and requested to join as well. The man contemplated that, as a recent animal patron, he might be perceived as an ordinary magician without skills. However, they needed one more member, so he decided to include Jang in the team. They navigated through the city of dead spirits in drizzling rain. The commander turned to Jean and inquired if he had seen the World Channel News, which reported that Beast patrons had the least damage. Jang explained that he had chosen the profession because he enjoyed raising animals. The girl in the robe appeared unimpressed with this answer. Suddenly, a spear was hurled in their direction, landing at their feet. The commander alerted the team that enemies were approaching, followed by crypts who were armed. The commander crushed the bones of one skeleton and delegated ranged monsters to the others. The new girl wielded a weapon and unleashed a fireball that annihilated several enemies. A skeleton sneaked up behind her, holding a knife to her throat. Jang joined the battle, summoning a flock of crows, a basic skill of the animal patron. He used the crows to distract his opponent and deal 50 points of magic damage. While his crows diverted the skeletons, the new girl expressed her gratitude to Jang, and they fled. Jang pointed out that these monsters would soon be reborn, urging them to hasten their escape. The team completed the battle and advanced, ultimately reaching the castle where the boss resided. Their strategy involved the knight charging the boss to absorb the damage, while the others attacked from behind, evading the boss's magic effect radius. In the second stage, the commander asked Jang how he possessed such knowledge, suspecting he had been there before. Jang playfully attributed it to online gaming experience. Team members spotted an epic rarity item, and the commander was astonished by Jang's level 15 poison dagger and dungeon expertise. He couldn't fathom how a novice player had such knowledge. The commander realized they had a wealth of valuable items, and this time, they were poised to make a significant profit. Jang entered the castle, and the team followed. He urged everyone to stay close together. The trio exchanged devilish grins, and the door sealed shut from the outside. Jang and the new girl remained in the castle, while the others outside proclaimed they'd be back soon. The girl angrily accused them of being on the same team. Jang discerned that they were in the wrong company, aiming to claim all the experience and rewards for themselves once they dealt with the boss. The boss made an appearance and an ice crystal was launched towards the pair. Jang grasped the girl's hand and shielded her. She expressed gratitude for saving her once again. The boss drew nearer, a level 30 zombie archman. The monster was gearing up for a new attack. Jang recognized that without a tank, they couldn't withstand the boss's onslaught. The girl cast a seal and summoned the warriors explaining that they manifested through her soul-summoning talent. However, their presence would be short-lived, and they needed to devise a plan. Soul-summoning was facilitated by a divine talent card, enabling her to summon deceased creatures to fight on their side. The effect lasted only five minutes, with a 24-hour recharge. Jang assured her that he only needed a bit of time. Jang assured her that he only needed a bit of time. He summoned a barrage of lightning bolts, leveraging his knowledge of the boss's weaknesses. The girl prepared to cover Jean during his assault and conjured multiple fireballs. On the archmage's neck, they spotted a gem, the source of his energy and his vulnerability. Jang summoned a flock of crows, diverting the archmage's attention. He approached and struck the gem, causing the monster's head to topple. They defeated the Archman, and Jang reached level 25, 
receiving an epic rarity scattered light staff. His skill, Ice Wind Scream, created a blizzard freezing opponents within 100 meters for 5 seconds while dealing 500 magic damage with a 1 hour recharge. They celebrated this fortunate drop with a 2% chance. They celebrated this fortunate drop with a 2% chance. Jang handed the staff to his companion, surprising her. He explained that it was a weapon for mages, necessary for the beast patron, and their survival was thanks to her talent. Outside, the traders overheard that the castle battle had ended. One of them assumed the boss had probably vanquished the two inside. The commander joyfully declared that it was time to collect their spoils. Jang forcefully opened the door as the traders approached. They were shocked to find the pair still alive. Jang asked if they were disappointed not to find corpses in their place. The commander drew his sword and reassured his men not to fear, confident that the two were already worn out. The traders moved in for an attack, and Jang positioned himself in front of the girl, brandishing his new staff. The commander swung his sword, while Jang stood before his comrade with open arms, questioning why they had betrayed their comrades. The commander, overcome with sorrow, kissed Jang's forehead and clasped his girlfriend's hand. Holding her hand, Jang copied her soul-summoning talent, creating a flash between their hands, which left the commander puzzled. They used it to revive the archman's soul, and Jang hurled this monster at the traitors, shocking them. The traitors froze and vanished, while players Sway and Wei were attacked by the archman's soul. The system determined they had no chance of revival, so they perished. Jang suddenly began to fall, collapsing to the floor, and his henchmen approached him. The player's endurance had reached a minimum, and they needed urgent rest. Jang's eyes started to dim, and he could barely see the girl. He was in second place in the ranking. In a room, a young boy sat on a couch, expressing boredom with those games to his father, who replied that he would buy a new game if the boy could defeat him. The boy eagerly aimed for first place, while the father took the book of God Hunters from the table and left down the endless corridor. The boy called after him, mentioning his predicament in the game, possibly preventing him from playing a new one. Jang found himself in a tavern room, waking up with a headache and no sense of how long he had slept. He poured a drink and noticed a letter on the table, reading it. It was from his partner Hanno, expressing gratitude for saving her and mentioning her quest to find her older brother. The letter also indicated that the storage ring contained useful items, and she hoped to meet again. Jang held the ring in his hand, smiled, and clenched it into a fist. The inventory appeared, suggesting that those guys had eliminated many players, resulting in a wealth of items. While sipping his drink, Jang realized he didn't need to worry about equipment anymore and focused on finding the beast. He opened the map, recalling a hidden dungeon in the north. The two of the Dragon Crown, where beasts up to level 40 could be found. He knew he had to choose teammates wisely to avoid a situation like with Wong. Jang ventured out into the city, contemplating the challenge of finding reliable players. He saw players seeking recruits for guilds and remembered that in his past life, joining a guild was the best way to recruit players. He decided to look for one. Jang entered the guild ministry, where he was welcomed by a guild manager eager to assist. Jang expressed his intention to start a guild. The manager handed over a book, instructing him to choose a name. Jang thought of the game's creator as a deity and players as challengers of this divine entity. Consequently, he decided to name the guild, Hunting the Gods. The manager congratulated him on creating the guild, and he became its first member. Jang contemplated recruiting members and initially considered distributing leaflets on the street, but realized it was a random approach. Instead, he thought of attending a place with many experts. 
recalling that there would be many experts at the first one-on-one -on -one dueling competition in the City of Hope, Jang decided to participate. The winner of this competition would receive 100 gold and a rare skill. Jang accepted the mission and prepared for the match. The arena was filled with participants, and an enthusiastic host welcomed everyone to the heavenly arena, a paradise for true fighters. As Jang looked around, he noticed that many players had already reached level 30, while he was still at level 25. Eager to level up quickly, he engaged in his first duel. In this bout, an assassin faced off against a magician who appeared motionless due to his equipment. The magician then extended his hand, using the exclusive mage skill called Shadow Prison, which paralyzed the enemy and inflicted shadow damage. The assassin, curious about how much money it would take for the magician to concede, offered a bribe. However, the magician, reflecting on his past and challenges, refused to give in. He remembered a time when his company went bankrupt, and he could have used the offered bribe. But now, he was determined never to give up, and there was no room for failure or defeat in his new life. In another match, Player Wui defeated player Jean Ming and advanced to the next round. The announcer cautioned everyone to be vigilant and expressed his deep admiration for Jang. The next round introduced Jang's opponent, Danan Fong, determined by the random selection process. The system instructed them to proceed to the designated location at the appointed time. In Jang's past life, he frequently saw Danan Fong's name on the World Channel as he was known for completing challenging dungeons single-handedly. Jang aimed to recruit him for his guild. The two were directed to Arena Number 20, where they were supposed to face each other. Danan Fong, already present at the arena, invited Jang to initiate the duel. He was a level 35 knight, which made Jang a bit anxious, as he considered his opponent to be an exceptional player. The duel commenced with Jang having 2,000 health points, while Danan had 2,500. Despite his lower level, Fong allowed Jang to make the first move, so as not to appear suspicious. Jang started the fight by summoning a flock of crows, and Danan acknowledged Jang's confidence in commencing the battle. Danan employed the Sword Guard, an exclusive knight skill that summoned multiple sword spirits. Each of these spirits could endure 500 damage and had the ability to reflect damage. As Jang attacked, the damage he inflicted was reflected back onto him, resulting in a 200 health point loss for Jang. Danan mockingly asked Jang if he was afraid to engage. Jang realized he needed to overcome this obstacle and considered his inventory, where he had recently acquired zombie armor. This armor allowed him to survive a fatal blow and recover 10% of his health with a 24-hour cooldown. Jang activated the zombie armor and relied on it, concentrating on defeating the enemy's sword spirits. He decided to employ a series of lightning bolts. Danan ridiculed Jang, asserting that he would not live long enough to even strike back. Wielding his sword, he proclaimed victory. Jang then used the zombie armor skill, surprising Danan as Jang survived the reflected damage. Danan Fong's character received a critical hit from Jang's poison dagger, resulting in a loss of 2,500 health points. Jang had successfully defeated player Danan Fong, advancing to the next round. He shook hands with his opponent and then invited Danan to join his guild which piqued Danan's interest in dungeons. However, Danan admitted underestimating Jang and asked for some time to consider the guild invitation. The host congratulated those who progressed to the next round and suggested watching the next round on the global channel. Jang noticed his former henchman, Hanu, taking the stage and engaging in a battle with her opponent in the heavenly arena. The audience discussed her skills and Jang considered recruiting her for the guild. Danan, on the other hand, 
needed some practice and asked Jang to message the guild chat if he required assistance. Jang was content with the pressure and support from his teammates and headed into the crowd to observe the battles. He was surprised to see Hana facing her opponent, Gui. Their battle began with an icy wind attack from Gui, launching a level 4 meteor shower. Each meteor could deal 500 units of fire damage. And the audience was both frustrated with Gui and impressed with Hanu's strength. However, something strange happened Gui disappeared into a whirlwind created by the meteors, leaving everyone bewildered. Jang had never seen such a skill and didn't know what had transpired. Hanu lay on the ground, apologizing to Jang for not protecting his gift. He reassured her that everything was okay and decided to reach the finals on his own. The spectators gathered around the arena, eagerly anticipating the battle. Wui and Jangi stood opposite each other, exchanging words. Wui laughed at the sight of Jang, while Jang expressed his disdain for those who took things from others. The duel began and Wu Yi struck his staff. The onlookers soon realized that the duelists had disappeared and were in a space of nothingness. Jang understood why Hanu had disappeared, as Wu Yi had created a separate space using a legendary talent. This virtual space boosted the creator's damage by 30% and reduced the opponent's damage by 30%. It lasted for five minutes, and Wu Yi was confident that no one could defeat him in this space, making chances for revival futile. Jang showed no leniency and continued to attack. He realized he couldn't copy the talent, and challenging the crows proved futile. Jang Yi was hit by a shadow arrow, causing him to lose 700 health points. Recognizing that he was in danger, Jang smiled and took his dagger, fatally injuring himself. As per the competition rules, Jang was revived in the same space. He utilized the soul summoning skill, creating a clone of himself, and prepared to face Wu Yi, who fought off the crows. Jang asked if Wu Yi was ready and initiated his attack. Wu Yi struggled to keep up with Jang's speed as he used the double skill, Row of Lightning. Wu Yi's health dropped by 800 points from the lightning attack. Wu attempted a counterattack with a dagger, but Jang's spirit protected him. The battle continued with Jang persistently attacking Wu. Eventually, Jang overpowered Wu, driving his head into the ground. A bright light filled the arena, and Jang emerged as the champion of the competition. Jang was awarded a chest that contained a piece of historical rarity equipment. He was delighted to replace his lost level 20 dagger. Jang told the defeated Wui not to resort to any misdeeds due to the game's outcome and advised him to be more honorable. After the victory, Jang handed a staff back to Hanu and inquired about her brother. She smiled and agreed to join his guild. Jang was amazed by the numerous guild applications he received, but he realized they needed to be selective when choosing players. As they took a breather in the city square, Jang noticed a player approaching them and immediately came to Hanu's defense. The player, Chen Long, bowed and mentioned he had important information about Hanu's missing brother. Jang decided to accompany Han when he spotted her. He explained that her brother had urgent matters and left Chen to safeguard her. Han clarified that Chen was a friend of her older brother. Jang calmed down and discussed their plans to visit the tomb. Chen agreed to join them. At the entrance to the Dragon Crown Tomb, Duan Fong praised Jang's rapid progress. Jang noticed Duan's good mood, and they decided to enter the dungeon together. Unbeknownst to them, there were observers hiding behind the rocks, watching the team and planning to inform their boss while gathering people at the dungeon entrance. As the team proceeded down the corridor, Hanu was intrigued by lifelike statues along the way. She examined a statue that suddenly came to life, startling her. Jang warned that these were Duan's main monsters and instructed Duan to act as the tank with others providing cover. 
they needed to stay close to each other. The battle commenced as the monster swung its sword. Duan confidently believed the metal monsters weren't a threat. He wielded his weapon and deflected the monster's attack with flames in his eyes, determined to defeat his opponent. Other team members engaged in combat against the remaining monsters. A level 35 dragon blood knight appeared on the horizon, mounted on a horse and armed with a sword. When Duan spotted the knight, Chen Long stepped in to protect him using the sword defense skill. Duan then unleashed the second level sword vortex skill, causing a whirlwind that inflicted 3,000 physical damage on everyone within its radius. Meanwhile, on the Tower of Eternity, the Master and the Secretary were in conversation. The Master had taken an interest in Jang, reminiscent of an old friend who was now deceased. He recalled how he had thrown his friend off a cliff out of curiosity. The Master decided to increase the difficulty for the team. The voracious dragon Shigura absorbed the power of its fallen subordinates, achieving the rank of a second-rank dragon. This development surprised Jang, but it meant that the boss would drop a superior monster egg. The player's health was rapidly decreasing due to the dragon's flames. Chen observed that they were in grave danger, and Jang ordered everyone to split up, run as far as possible, and avoid the dragon's attacks. He instructed Duan to use his sword's defensive ability. The knight brandished his sword, and the attack persisted. The team skillfully evaded the dragon's onslaught, but the sword's defense couldn't endure such massive damage. Duan acknowledged that the shield would not hold during the dragon's next fire breath. Jang assured him that he had a plan. As the dragon flew away, its fiery breath waning, Jang instructed Chin Mong to fire arrows at the dragon's vulnerable point its eyes. Chin Long used the Sphic Arrow, a fourth-level archer's exclusive skill that fired an arrow with a sleeping pill, silencing the target for four seconds. The first arrow hit the dragon, causing it to fall. With the dragon weakened and susceptible to 100% more damage, the team prepared for their attack. Han unleashed the ice wind scream, and Jang, with his new dragon sword, struck the dragon with his modified attribute. The battle ended, with the team successfully defeating the second-rank greedy crown dragon Shigura. From the dragon's remains, loot was acquired, including a greed breastplate, greed sword, greed daggers, and an egg. Jang was thrilled about the loot and asked the team to inspect it. He explained that he only wanted the egg, so they were welcome to claim the equipment. However, other players suddenly entered the dungeon with the intent of attacking Jang's team. Chen Long swiftly flew up to shield Jang and bore the brunt of their attack. Touched by this sacrifice, Jang was grateful for Chen Long's protection. Chen Long assured them it was his duty and mentioned that he had a chance of revival. He would wait for them in the city and ask Chang to look after Han. The trio inquired about the intruder's intentions. And Wui, their persistent rival, emerged, reminding them of his vow for revenge. Duan was already preparing his weapon, but Jang was surprised to see Wui again and requested to face him on his own. Jang made a cut on his hand, letting his blood fall to the ground. The egg reacted bleeding and summoning a dragon a rare apocalypse beast. Jang sought to form a contract with the dragon by joining hands. A small dragon hatched from the egg, astounding the trio with its elegance. Their rivals were momentarily silenced by the adorable creature. Nevertheless, they laughed at the baby dragon and ridiculed its size, even suggesting they could easily crush it. The baby dragon grew infuriated, and unleash fire from its mouth at the jeering players, causing their health to plummet to zero. The dragon's flames incinerated the taunting bullies, leaving the onlookers bewildered by the sudden and immense damage it had inflicted. The vanquished rivals vanished from the dungeon. Jang approached the dragon and gently placed it on his shoulder, 
while suggesting that the others return. Han felt angered by the situation. Jang recalled the unusual symbols on the intruder's equipment and suspected they might belong to another faction or race. He couldn't comprehend what they were doing in the dungeons. His mind continued to ponder the significance of those mysterious symbols. As they reached the evening city, Chen long awaited their return. He waved to them, his excitement apparent. When Chen Long attempted to approach the baby dragon, it reacted with irritation and spewed flames, displaying a rather complex personality. Because players from Zone 886 had defeated the greedy crown dragon Shigura, a secret dungeon's world boss, the Golden Skeleton King, had arrived in the City of Hope. Earlier warnings had notified players to prepare for this occurrence, which was a surprise to Jang as it hadn't happened in his previous life. A green tempest erupted in the sky, leaving Jang awestruck by the striking entrance of the king. He wondered about the king's formidable strength and recollected the carnage wrought by the king in his previous life, when he had single-handedly annihilated half of the City of Hope and eliminated 60% of the players. In this new game world, the Apocalypse City would only become accessible after the Golden Skeleton King's defeat, which was the key to finding Muchen. Some players brought two dragon eggs to another, who couldn't fathom why one more egg was missing. It appeared to him that in Zone 886, they had encountered the patron saint of beasts, who had slain a dragon before them and formed a contract. The player was intrigued but ultimately allowed the boy with the eggs to depart. In his room, the man had many dragon eggs, and he was one of those responsible for unleashing the world boss, the Golden Skeleton King. With the arrival of the Golden Skeleton King, the system urgently called upon players to defend the City of Hope. The apology was extended to Shigura, and players were encouraged to avenge him. The King's crown ascended, resulting in a massive explosion. Skeletal minions commenced their assault, catching all players off guard. They were astonished that a level 50 boss had reached them so early. Some players anticipated good equipment drops, while others harbored resentment toward those responsible for summoning the boss. The mission at hand was to safeguard the City of Hope, with players aiming to prevent the Golden Skeleton King from attacking the city. The top three players who dealt the most damage to the king would be rewarded with substantial experience, gold, and legendary equipment. Failing the mission meant the death of all players in Zone 886. Jang realized that things were unfolding much like his previous life, but recognized the need for swift action. He directed his team not to panic and explained that the skeleton king moved slowly. Their primary objective was to maintain a safe distance of 100 meters and engage in ranged attacks. As they positioned themselves before the king, Jang reiterated that success hinged on following instructions. The attack commenced, with Duan Fong responsible for luring mobs while the others concentrated on the boss. As they approached the king, the Golden Skeleton King issued orders for his minions to eliminate the players, thus initiating their offensive. They skillfully decapitated the attacking skeletons. Among them, a girl was targeted by a skeleton while she was tending to her wounded friend. Jane clarified that it was extremely perilous outside the city, and the best course of action was to return to the city while safeguarding the girl and her friend. She looked back at Jang, who was on his way to confront the king, while the pack of monsters continued their advance. Jang issued a warning to everyone to exercise caution regarding the groups of skeletons and requested that Duan Fong deal with them. Duan agreed and unsheathed his sword, unleashing the shadow swirl to disintegrate the skeletons' heads. Two individuals in robes conversed in hushed tones, expressing concern that if Duan continued in this manner, the entirety of the reward would go to the god hunters. One of them cast a glance in Jang's direction and instructed their henchmen to contact the other guild leaders, 
expressing reluctance about Zhang and his team monopolizing the rewards. Behind Zhang, a group of individuals readied a fireball and directed it towards him. He turned around and inquired about their intentions. The robed man asserted that they had come to claim the World Boss Award and deemed others who thought they could defeat the Skeleton King as greedy idiots. Instead of assisting, they obstructed the situation. Jang responded that he had no time for them and challenged them to prove their worth through force. The boss ridiculed the people and declared that he would send them all to hell, preparing to strike them with his sword. The players sought refuge behind a golden shield to shield themselves from the skeleton king's attack. Jang was bewildered by the unfolding events. The girl he had helped was nearby and informed him that she noticed the absence of a heavy hitter in Jang's team, prompting her to offer her assistance. Jang expressed his gratitude. The chief instructed Han to move away, as her foot had become stuck in the ground. The Golden King loomed before her, and Shang urgently cautioned Han. The boss warned that resistance was futile, asserting that death was the sole escape. He swung at Han, but her older brother intervened, deflecting the attack and urging Han to flee. The boss scoffed at the brother's attempt to incapacitate him, proclaiming himself the king of death who had yet to unleash his full power. He eagerly goaded the brother to demonstrate the might of a king of death. The boy leaped into action, inflicting damage upon the king and reducing his health by 5,000. The boy anticipated a formidable response, but the golden skeleton king laughed off his blows as mere tickles. Undeterred, the boy activated the berserker state, imploring the king to witness his transformation. The berserker state was an exclusive combat form that traded 1% of health per second for a 10% increase in damage. The boy surged forward, urging the king to take his blood and grant him great strength. The king's health dwindled further, falling to two-thirds. The golden skeleton king tumbled to the ground, with the boy inquiring if he still found it ticklish. The king seethed with fury and swung his weapon with vengeance, intending to exact retribution. The boy endured the blow with resolve. Their battle grew more intense, and observers watched closely. Jang discerned that the boy seemed willing to lose health to gain strength, but with his health at a minimum, a single misstep could lead to death. Thanks for watching and have a great day.